Good evening, everybody. I'm Betsy Fisher-Martin, the Executive Director of the Women in Politics Institute at American University. And welcome to another installment of our virtual summer series, Otto Washington, who has just written a new book called Use the Power You Have, A Brown Woman's Guide to Politics and Political Change. It's packed with stories from her career, as well as important lessons she's learned along the way. And we'll talk about uh, several of those. Uh, and I'll save plenty of time for your questions. So at the bottom of the screen, you'll see uh, a button that says ask a question and please do so during the course of our discussion. Um, you'll also be able to upvote questions from others in the audience that you're interested in. And in the middle of the screen, there's a green button on the bottom in the middle that'll open up a new window and link to order a copy of the Congresswoman's book. And if you miss any of our discussion or you wanna share it with friends, the replay will be available at the same link you use to register. So Congresswoman, thanks so much for being here. Welcome. Thank you, Betsy. It's so great to be with you. And I'm watching the chat of people from all over the country in yes. Seattle. So that is great. And I see Puyallup on here as well. So fantastic. Thank you all for joining us. Yeah, this is the really the good thing about being able to do these conversations uh, during this time is that people are able to engage with us uh, from all over. So we're happy to see lots of different folks here. Um, your book has been described as a blueprint for women of color who are ready to seize the moment. Uh, tell us why it was important for you to write this book at this time. Well, um, you know, it actually was originally going to be a book on immigration. This was <laughs> I got the book contract way back in 2013, and then I ended up running for the state Senate and then for Congress and writing a book just fell to the back of the of the agenda. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that this transition from activism to politics, number one, was something I really wanted to explore mm -hmm. and what it means to be an activist in office, what it means to build progressive power in office. But then I noticed that the things that people wanted to ask me about all the time in any talk, no matter what the substance was, is what is it like to be a woman? in Congress? What is it like to be a woman of color in Congress? What particular barriers do you face? And so I felt like I had to weave that through the book as well, because it was so much a part of the things that I experienced. And so I hope that it's um, a guide for not only women of color, but for women in general, and for those who are seeking to build uh, you know, political power and to understand the levers of power and the challenges of negotiating big um, male dominated environments <laughs> like Congress. So you, at the very beginning of the book, you talk about immigrants who live in the hyphen. Um, you were born in India, raised mostly in Indonesia and came to the US by yourself at age 16 to attend Georgetown University. How has that immigrant experience shaped you? Well, in the beginning of the book, I talk about, um, you know, Hamilton and Lin-Manuel Miranda's um, uh -huh. phrase, immigrants, we get the job done. I think that there's a lot in the book that is about working hard, um, mm -hmm. you know, not being able to even contemplate failure. When your parents take their last $5,000 and they send you across the ocean um, to get a better education and to have more opportunity, knowing that you might never live on the same continent as them, as right. is the case with me. Um, you really, failure is not an option. And I think that that pressure um, on us, that responsibility, but also, you know, the tremendous opportunity that opens, I think affects everything. And then of course, my decades of work on immigration and immigrant rights is deeply informed by my own experience as an immigrant, one of yeah. only 14 in the United States Congress to be naturalized and to serve in Congress. So um, toward the end of the book, the last chapter is um, a lot of different lessons that you learned in your rise to political power. And I want to talk about a couple of those and then give you the chance to tell some of the stories behind the lessons, because I think they're they're terrific. Um, the first one, um, you say, own yourself and stay open. Uh, and then you say, don't try to be who you're not. Um, and don't let power tilt your head away from what it is that you're really fighting for. Tell us about your experience in fighting for causes that you believed in and what you learned from that. Yeah, well, the, the piece about be who you are is yeah. I think a lot of politics and a lot of, polit uh, a lot of consultants to politicians or people who are running candidates, they, they sort of had a, and this is changing, but they had a very set formula of how you're supposed to run. And, you know, I was often told, well, your name is funny or, you know, don't focus on this. Don't focus on your immigrant identity. And I knew 
that for me to run and to to be authentic to who I am, I needed to be authentic to who I am. And so, you know, we found a way to weave my story into everything. I was going to be a bold progressive because that's what I believe in. And right. if I can't win that way, I'm not that interested in running. And so I think that, um, you know, often you're told that politics is the art of the possible and you need to compromise. But the reality is that politics is the art of the possible and it's up to us to shift the boundaries of what's possible. Mm -hmm. And compromise needs to be principled. And people want to, they don't have to agree with you on 100% of things, but they want to know who you are. They right. want you to be authentic um, to what you believe in. And then you can have a discussion if you disagree. So I think that's just really important for people to own themselves and to think about what they want to do, not who they want to be. This isn't just about a title. It's about what we want to accomplish with the platform we have. Tell us about um, hate, the Hate Free Zone, One America that you started. I started that right after 9-11. It was not meant to be an organization. Um, I was not actually, I was doing international global development work before starting that. But then 9-11 happened and I realized I was getting called by all these people who were the targets of individual hate, you know, hate crimes against Muslims, Arabs, South Asians. And then very quickly that shifted into um, the government, the Bush administration at the time, um, incur, you know, incursions on civil liberties of people, secret detentions, deportations, the passage of the Patriot Act. And I ended up starting this organization that um, was really intended initially just to be around hate crimes by individuals against mm -hmm. other individuals, but ended up being the large, I, I ran it for 12 years, it ended up being the largest immigrant advocacy organization in the state, one of the largest in the country. We, um, we sued the Bush administration successfully around the deportation of Somalis, 4,000 Somalis across the country. We won. We um, fought on behalf of immigration reform. We ran the largest voter registration drive in the history of the state. You know, we did a lot of things that were about protecting immigrant rights and also broader than that, protecting economic justice, a $15 minimum wage, mm -hmm. collective bargaining rights, LGBTQ equality. Um, and it was really a phenomenal experience for me and, and honor that the organization is still alive and well and still doing amazing things. And part of the reason why Washington State, frankly, is so far ahead on immigration issues in particular, but on many of these things, including minimum wage. You also write about your experience um, going to Thailand and you said it was the first time I understood that vocation and avocation could, in fact, be the same thing. Yes, because when I came to the United States, you know, any um, immigrant parent who uses their last savings to send you to the U.S., there were three professions I was I was allowed to be a doctor, <laughs> a lawyer or an engineer. And um, it was my sophomore year of college at Georgetown. We were poor. So I only had one phone call home a year. There was wow. no Skype or anything like that. And I called my dad from the ho uh, hall phone to tell him that I wanted to be an English literature major instead of an economics major. And then I had to hold the phone away from my ear as he <laughs> screamed at me and said, I didn't send you to the United States to learn how to speak English. You already know how to speak English. <laughs> So I, I went to work on Wall Street and I went, you know, for two years, I got a master's in business. But in the middle of my business school years, I got very, I, I just was I knew I was not I was not happy with what I was doing. And I felt like I wanted my job and my interest to be the same. So mm -hmm. a vocation and avocation. And I got an internship um, when all my friends were going to work back on Wall Street or management consulting firms in between my summers of graduate school. I went to work in Thailand for a nonprofit organization along the borders of Laos and Cambodia and mm -hmm. in a refugee camp. And I um, you know, just learned so much there about what would end up being a big part of my world later on, migration, immigration, mm -hmm. many of those issues. Um, and it was so uh, incredible to me both to be deeply involved as my job in something that I cared so much about and also in recognizing that the problems we face are enormous and that I wanted to be a part of those kinds of solutions. So it was after that uh, it took maybe a year and a half more mm -hmm. but after that that I ended up switching from the private sector to the nonprofit sector and doing international development work for 10 years before starting Hate Free Zone. So another lesson you have in the book is uh, look for the better angels in everyone. Don't let the lesser angels diminish you. 
Yes, because that is something that happens all the time. I find mm -hmm. that people look at me as a woman of color um, in these male dominated, primarily white male dominated environments that I've been in, and they diminish you. They say things, they are, you know, I've had, um, these have been fairly well publicized, but uh, Republican Alaska Congressman Don Young, who um, called me young lady and told me I didn't know a damn thing about what I was talking about on the floor. And I wow. demanded a public apology and essentially um, shut down the floor uh, in that moment. It was three months into being a new member of Congress. And as he's saying this to me on the floor, I'm thinking to myself, I can't believe that this, this person is saying this to me. And somehow in the recesses of my mind, I remembered an orientation session that Steny Hoyer had given that said, when somebody insults you, um, you can ask them to take down their words. I will tell you, I had no idea what that meant. I literally <laughs> had no but you knew idea. enough to ask for it. But I knew enough to ask for it. And so I stood there looking very confident and said, I demand that the gentleman take down his words. And immediately this hush comes over the floor and Paul Ryan was speaker at the time, his floor leader comes running over to me, the parliamentarians are coming out and I'm thinking to myself, okay, I've done something significant, but I'm not really sure what the next steps are. And um, when the floor leader came over to me, he said, you know, Congresswoman, I'm really sorry, you know, would you be willing to accept striking the words from the record? And when he asked me that, I realized that if he was asking me that, I had some leverage to say no. Right. and maybe to get what I wanted, which was a public apology on the floor. And um, so I said that. I said, well, I would be willing, but I would like a public apology from from the congressman. And he looked at me in disbelief and he said, I I I'm sorry, Congresswoman, I don't think you understand. That's Don Young. And uh, meaning that Don Young does this all the time and he never apologizes, I guess. I don't really know. And I said, well, I'm sorry. I don't think you understand. I'm Pramila Jayapal. Yeah. <laughs> and I want an apology. So I just think that we can't let these things diminish us. They yeah. are intended to take on power. And I said this on the floor the other day when uh, AOC was, was talking about Ted Yoho. And right. I got up and I said, you know, these words that people use, these insults, the things they lobby at us, these men lobby at us are really about power. Um, and I talked to, about the word, the five letter word that starts with a B um, and rhymes with which <laughs> that, um, that word saw prominence um, during the time of 1915 to 1930. Why? Because that was when women were given the right to vote in 1920. Mm -hmm. And so that rise of women's power is at the core of these insults. And we just can't allow them to diminish us. We have to be strong in who we are. And if they're intimidated by us, great. Um, they should be because we're very powerful. Well, I mean, you wrote in the book, some people operate on the principle that they can only be big by making you small. And I think that's so so true. Um, so the better angel component of that lesson, you also have a great story about when you were in the state Senate working across the aisle um, with a Republican state senator. Um, tell us that story of how that came to be and what you were able to accomplish in that alliance. Yes, that was such a beautiful story. Um, we were fighting a payday lending bill. Uh -huh. We had already had some of the strongest payday protections and this bill came up um, funded by the payday lobbyists. And uh, it was a brutal debate on the floor, really brutal. And um, at the end of the day, we had we had dozens of amendments that the majority leader, the minority leader, and I were putting forward. And at the end of the day, the vote came, and we were in the min min minority, so we knew we were going to lose. Um, but I noticed that as we were done with the vote count, there was one Republican that voted with us, Democrats. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know him. I was It was pretty early in my tenure as a state senator. And so I went over to him and I, I said, uh, he was sitting at his desk on the floor and I said, um, you know, I just wanted to say thank you to you um, and ask you, why did you vote the way you did? Why did you vote with us and cross the aisle? And he put his head in his hands and he kind of shook his head and then he looked up at me and he said, he said, um, uh, I, I, it's just unjust. You know, I just couldn't, I couldn't, I had to do what was right. And that story was so beautiful because he had tears in his eyes. I had tears in my mm -hmm. eyes. It was, it was about two o'clock in the morning. 
And I said, well, you know, I would really love to work with you on some other things. And he said, well, let's take on credit card debt because, you know, I have a lot of constituents who sleep in their cars mm -hmm. and they can't afford anything. They, they, they need payday loans, but they, right. but they need loans that are not going to take advantage of them. So we ended up having a really great friendship after that. He worked with me on the Voting Rights Act and a few other things. Um, he was the majority um, he was the chairman of the Natural Resources Committee. I was his ranking member. So, you know, I just think that sometimes you have to be ready for those moments when somebody is actually ready to be with you. Mm -hmm. And you can't just assume you know what people stand for. You never know when there's going to be an opportunity. So look for those better angels and be open to those moments where perhaps you were wrong about your stereotypes or about right. preconceived notions. Um, here's another lesson. Courage is a muscle. Learn to flex it in the face of urgency. Yes, this is a big one. I've been trying to build progressive power yeah. within Congress. And you know, sometimes that means taking on the people that you love. Right. Um, it means taking on your own party because you don't think we're going far enough. Um, it means being willing to vote against leadership, which is not a popular thing to do. But I really believe that courage is something that is, um, is practice, that the more courage you display, the more you have. And I think that sometimes people are afraid and they think that being courageous means acting when you feel certain about what you're going to do. But mm -hmm. in fact, courage is the ability to act in spite of fear to be able to speak out for what you think is right. And, um, and you know, that is something that requires practice. So as we build bolder progressive political power, sometimes we need people to vote against leadership and against our own um, because we're trying to push for something better. Um, and, and that kind of, that requires the ability to be courageous. And I will also say that courage uh, I think I say this in the book, courage begets courage. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just look at the whistleblowers who came out during impeachment. Once one came out right. um, and had that tremendous courage, others saw that courage. Or and the Me Too saw, movement. Exactly, yeah. or the Me Too movement, perfect example. Um, and so courage begets courage. And I think that we just have to remember that and continue to flex that muscle, practice that skill. And when you write about taking on President Obama, who you, of course, you know, really admired and worked well with, but you took him on on the issue of immigration. I did. And, um, you know, I, I, I wept when President Obama was elected, as so many people across this country did. I mean, the, the, what he stood for, who he was, um, and, and who he still is. And so this, you know, I think, but when he started deporting more immigrants than any president before, I called him the deporter in chief um, because it was true. And I think that we have to be willing to not to be willing to take people on, um, but with, you know, with compassion and with integrity, but to still say this, what you're doing is wrong because everybody needs to be pushed, mm -hmm. um, us included. You know, I have constituents who push me. Some people say, oh, I can't imagine that you have anyone further to the left. Well, I really do. Um, and so, you know, sometimes that happens, but it's good. It's good for us to be pushed in either direction because it forces us to think about what we're doing and not just buy into what may have been okay before. And I think honestly, that's what President Obama did yeah. with deportation. We've criminalized immigrants for decades in this country, and that's been Republican and Democratic presidents. Under Bill Clinton, actually, in 1996 was the beginnings of that. And so it's very important that the Democratic Party also and the leadership take on these tropes and be willing to step away from them. So I had to call him out on it. And I still love the guy, yeah. you know, watching him give the eulogy for John Lewis. I just was so, uh, was so moved. And I thought, oh, how different the world would be if he were still our president. But that doesn't mean we can't take on things we yeah. think are wrong. So as you look at um, Vice President Biden and his candidacy, do you think that he is progressive enough or are there things that you would like to see him advocate uh, more that he's not doing? Well, you know, I was a I was a Bernie Sanders supporter. Yeah, so I know that. <laughs> I, I can't I can't you know I can't say we, we've turned Joe Biden into Bernie Sanders, but um, I believe that there's no no progress possible with Donald Trump in the White House. So I am 150 percent behind Joe Biden, um, and that doesn't mean sometimes I'm behind him pushing, right? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm by his side, and sometimes I'm out front. I still believe in Medicare for all. I believe that a universal guaranteed government healthcare system where everybody is in and nobody is out 
is the only way forward. And you see it in this pandemic. Was I able to get Joe Biden 100% there? No, but we were able to move him substantially as I co-chaired the Unity Health Task Force. And we will continue to push him, but we've got to get him in office first. Right. And then we'll have a president that will actually respond to our pushing. This guy right now, there's none of that. It's, it's, uh, it's just cruelty abounding. And so, um, you know, I, I don't think Joe Biden is, is quite where I want him to be on many things, but he's moved considerably. And it's certainly we, the movement, has created the most progressive presidential platform for the Democratic Party that we've had in recent history. Do you find that his campaign and the folks on his campaign are willing to um, be open and have discussions with various constituencies? Yes, I think that that has been happening. And I will just say the healthcare task force was an example. I mean, even though we didn't get Medicare for all, we were able, and you know, the, the thing about that particular issue is that that is Biden's legacy as the Affordable Care Act. So the right. stick in the sand was in there very early on. So I recognized that and we tried to push for Medicare for all, we weren't gonna get it. So then the question became, okay, what can we take that is substantial movement? And we got it, you know, the public option being administered by Medicare, a commitment to that, not by private insurance companies, taking on costs of prescription drugs with a more aggressive plan than we even passed in the House of Representatives, um, taking on long-term supports and services, 600,000 new home care jobs at $15 a minimum wage, plus benefits, mostly women, mostly folks of color. I mean, these are enormous steps forward. And uh -huh. so I do feel like that's true. And the other example I would say, because I have a lot of young people who are very discouraged about the state of the world right now, right. Um, is you look at the movement for black lives. And this is an example of how in organizing and in politics, you organize and you organize and you organize, sometimes for years, sometimes for decades, and you never know what the tipping point moment will be. We couldn't have planned and we wouldn't have wanted to plan the murder of George Floyd, but that murder awakened people across this country to the legacy of anti-blackness and white supremacy. Mm -hmm. And it led to within two weeks, the most sweeping set of changes ever proposed in decades in Congress to police accountability. So, um, and that bill passed the house. So we just have to see the possible as not being a static thing. The possible is fluid and it changes based on the environment, based on the organizing and based on the movements. Well, and you just alluded to some examples of this too, but another lesson in the book is pick your battles, always thinking about, always think about the long vision and not just the short fight. Um, and then you also explain, I think too, the importance of policy because you said too often organizers want change, but then when they are let in the door, they don't have any real policy proposals to put forward. How important is it to, from a, from that perspective to try to, come up with the policies, um, you know, so that you can implement change. It's really important. It's it, not everybody has this in them. Some yeah. people just don't want to get into it. Um, I am somebody who really likes the big picture, but I also like to know the details. I feel okay. like it's very important to get good policy done to know the details. And so our Domestic Workers Bill of Rights, again, benefiting you know women and women of color across this country was spent six months delving into the details. Medicare for all, six months delving into the details. The dignity for detained immigrants, six months of you know coalition work and years uh, on each of these things, years in advance. Antitrust, um, a new committee for me, but I like the details. So I do think not everybody has to have it, but you do have to have people that understand policy because at the end of the day, whatever you get in terms of legislation, the policy matters and you won't get everything. So you got to figure out what are the biggest things that are going to make the biggest difference and what is it that will really move the ball forward for whatever your future vision is. So I do think those two things are important and you know, if you don't pick your battles, and we see this as women every day, right? If we took on every sexist thing that was said, we'd be exhausted and we wouldn't have time for the big battles. So we can't take on everything, but we do take on some things because right. it is important to have your voice out there. And the Me Too movement has been so incredibly inspiring with the stories and the courage to tell those stories as part of painting the picture of the pattern of abuse that's wrong. 
Um, and then from a personal perspective, you have um, another lesson. There's never a right time. Nurture those things that matter most. Talk about how you're able to do that. Well, it's hard. You know, I am a, I'm a bit of a, I, I'm a, I drive myself hard. <laughs> And um, I work all the time and I have to really work at making sure that I am taking care of myself, that I'm taking care of my family. Um, my kids are so important to me, my husband, my dog. Um, and so I try to um, stick to the commitments I've made to my family and to my loved ones. And that means that, you know, we postponed our honeymoon. I talk about this in the book um, for for uh, over 10 years. And then I finally was like, okay, we need to go on. No, we, should do this. <laughs> we plan the honeymoon. It's to Italy. And of course, the Mueller report comes out as I'm on the plane to Italy. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and it just so happens that the Medicare for All hearing that I had been fighting for for two years, the first hearing on Medicare for All, in the House of Representatives ever in history is going to be held two days after I come back from Italy. And so, um, you know, I'm trying to navigate all these things in some quiet little um, agriturismo in the rural, <laughs> rural south of Italy. Meanwhile, I'm reading the Mueller report. That for the sounds very time. romantic for your honeymoon. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my husband is so amazing and so supportive. And um, he, you know, he, he sort of, uh, uh, rolled his eyes at the beginning, but then was like, oh my God, this is about our democracy and our constitution. Please read yeah. the book. Here, let me bring you another glass of wine. Maybe it'll, <laughs> maybe it'll get you through the next 10 pages. So you alluded to fear a little bit earlier, but you have another lesson in the book that says practice makes perfect and fear can be conquered. And you talk about, for example, that you used to be terrified of public speaking and you would <laughs> never know that watching you now, but how did you sort of overcome that? Nobody ever believes me when I say that. <laughs> I tell my staff this because they're all terrified. You know, many of them yeah. are terrified of speaking. Um, I I used to be terrified of public speaking so much so that when I worked at PATH, an international development organization, and I had to do just a group meeting, you know, just mm -hmm. a regular group meeting that I had to lead, I sometimes would feel so sick I would call in, uh, you know, nauseous. Yeah. I would end up calling in sick. Um, just because I just didn't think I could do that in front of people. And, and then I wrote my first book, Pilgrimage, um, A Woman Revisits Her Homeland, which came out in 2000. And um, again, I was so nervous doing that reading. But when I started reading, I realized these were the words I'd been working on for years. And they were my words, and I was comfortable with them. And then I finished the reading, and there was so much love in the room. And people started asking questions and I realized, oh, I can answer these questions. This isn't hard. Mm -hmm. And so I just practiced it and I do practice. Um, I work very hard at everything I do. I watch when I'm on TV, I watch those TV clips so I can assess what I can do better. Um, you know, I, I practice my scripts before hearings. I do a lot of deep research to make sure I know what I'm talking about. And so I do think we have to work hard. And sometimes as women, I think we often have to work harder as women of color, even harder. Right. Sometimes people say to me, it's so unfair. We have to work so much harder than those white men. And I always say, well, it's true. It is unfair. But imagine how much better the world would be if everybody worked as hard as we work. Right. We would have a more just society. So I'd rather get to that place than have us say we don't have to work as hard. So I want to, you mentioned that um, hearings. I want to play a little clip for folks. Um, this is just uh, some of your greatest recent hits um, to give people a sense if they haven't seen them already, um, sort of the, uh, the way that you approach uh, your hearings and how you're able to hold public officials uh, and technology CEOs uh, accountable um, when they're testifying. So let me play. Um, let me play a um, clip of that for um, for everybody to watch for a minute or so. Let's see. There we go. The point I'm trying to make here, Mr. Barr, that I think is very important for the country to understand is that there is a real discrepancy in how you react as the Attorney General, the top cop in this country, when white men with swastikas storm a government building with guns, there is no need for the president to, quote, activate you because they're getting the president's personal agenda done. But when black people and people of color 
protest police brutality, systemic racism, and the president's very own lack of response to those critical issues, then you forcibly remove them with armed federal officers, pepper bombs, because they are considered terrorists by the president. Did I get it right, Mr. Barr? So let me ask you, Mr. Bezos, does Amazon ever access and use third-party seller data when making business decisions? And just a yes or no will suffice, sir. But I can't answer that question, yes or no. I can't guarantee you that that policy has never been violated. I'll take that as a you're not denying that. You're looking into it. So you can set the rules of the game for your competitors, but not actually follow those same rules for yourself. Do you think that's fair to the mom and pop third party businesses who are trying to sell on your platform? How many competitors did Facebook end up copying? Uh, Congresswoman, I, I can't give you a, a, a number of, of companies. Is it less than five? Yeah. Congresswoman, I don't know. About less than 15? Any estimates? <laughs> so that's called using your voice. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and uh, um, my comms team did a great job of pulling out, you know, Bill Barr adjusting his tie and <laughs> Zuckerberg blinking a lot. But yes, I think it's important to use your voice and to be strong and to be prepared. You know, many times people think that we're not we're not smart enough or we're not prepared enough, and I'm never going to let anybody say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, one more uh, lesson I want to talk about before we go to questions. So just a reminder, everybody, if you have questions, please um, go ahead and submit those. You say leave space for new leadership to emerge always. Don't hang on to power. Yes. Yes, I think this is very important. And it's a central part of my organizing background. You know, we stand on the shoulders of people that came before us. I was given some room by leaders in the field to become a leader myself. And that's been a big part of what I've tried to bring into everything I do, mentoring others, but also stepping aside. I stepped aside as executive director of One America and people said to me, why are you stepping aside? You know, the organization is so successful. This is the peak. Mm -hmm. And I said, because I think that it's our responsibility to make room. And you see it in Congress, too many people stay for too long. And I think people need to step aside. They need to allow new leadership to come in and embrace that leadership. They will bring something new and very important to the table. You will learn from it and they will learn from you. This is a partnership and we shouldn't just hang on to power. It's very, it's an aphrodisiac to have it, but um, the purpose of power is for people's benefit, not for us to be able to just hang on to it. So do you have a copy of your book there with you? I do, yes. I wanted you, they, um, I wanted you to, if you wouldn't mind, before we go to questions, you have a prayer at the end of the book um, that I think is um, really nice. And I think folks might want to, to hear that. And so I was going to ask if you could just read that uh, for us. Yes, absolutely. Before we go to questions. Um, yeah, so this is the very, very end of the book. Yeah. And it's the afterword. Here is my prayer for all of us as we walk the paths that unfold in front of us. I wish for rebellion and laughter, the grace of fate and the dreams of the day as well as the night. I wish for respect of ourselves and our intuition and a respect of that which we cannot know. I wish that we remember those who came before and those who have yet to come, that we do not forget where we have come from or what has been taken that must have time to replenish. I wish for the fertility of imagination and the conviction of possibility. If politics is the art of the possible, then never forget it is our job to push the boundaries of what is seen as possible. It is our job to bring the movement of we to life. That's great, thank you for reading that. Yeah. Um, and I, we have a lot of questions. So let me just jump into a couple of these. Um, this one is from Jessica and she asked, what advice do you have for immigrant women who want to work in politics, whose families or cultures aren't supportive of them getting involved? That was mine. I mean, my parents really, you know, they're, they're very supportive now, but they were not interested in this because it didn't make enough money. It wasn't certainty. It wasn't the things that they knew. Um, and so I would just say, I think it's important to 
talk to them about how it makes you feel. Mm -hmm. Talk to them about the joy that this work brings you and the conviction that you have around it. And then ask them to trust you. Say that they raised you with the right values and they raised you so that you would trust yourself. And so they also need to trust that you know what you're doing. And you know, also tell them that no decision is ever permanent. If it's the wrong decision, you can always change it later, but it's important for you to follow your heart. And it's so important for them to support you in what you do because you are what they helped make you. Right. Uh, and so I think that's the best way to deal with it. Great, um, here is a question from Shana. Um, she says, there are a lot of men who think women um, are too emotional to be in politics or take a leadership role, what would be your approach in countering this belief? I talk about this quite a bit in my book in different ways, mm -hmm. um, both in terms of, you know, sometimes I, I am very passionate and even when I get angry, I feel tears coming to me, but also the idea that somehow if you're in elected office or in your leadership, you're supposed to be dispassionate. I actually think part of the problem with government is that there are too many people who believe we don't feel anything, that we don't see what their pain is, and that we ourselves don't have struggles and challenges. And so the more diverse we are, the more we can show that that's not true. So that's why I talked about what it meant for me to have an abortion. And I used my platform to talk about why it's so important to protect the right for for people to pregnant people to make choices about their own bodies. I talked about my own kid coming out as gender non-conforming and why that was so important. And I got emotional in those moments. And you know, it wasn't what I planned, but those moments went viral in a way that others do not because people respond to authenticity and they respond to passion and emotion. And I would much rather have a government full of people who truly feel and therefore are focused on the best policy for other people who feel the pain that's going on than a government full of people who are dispassionate and have no idea what, um, or never display what people are actually dealing with and feeling. Great, um, here's a question from Sadie. Um, she says, you've accomplished an astounding amount throughout your career. How do you decide where to start, what to prioritize when planning to make a change? How do you and your team avoid decision fatigue and burnout? Oh, this is a tough one for me, um, you know, because here's the thing I like to say, um, you know, I did a book talk with Kimberly Crenshaw, who's the amazing, um, you know, originator of the idea of intersectionality or the mm -hmm. term intersectionality. Um, I like to say I'm not a woman on Monday, a mom on Tuesday, a, a, a worker on Wednesday, and an immigrant on Thursday. I'm all of those things all of the time. So the idea that I can only work on one thing is impossible for me. So I do have a deep breath uh, um, of and depth of issues that I work on. And I think that's okay because I think they are all deeply interconnected. I did start with immigration, and so mm -hmm. I have a deep familiarity there, but that very quickly connected to economic justice, $15 minimum wage, paid sick leave, um, and now I'm, I'm in antitrust because I really see the connections between these issues. So um, burnout is a, is a tough one. I'm not always so good at that, but, uh, <laughs> but I do tend to attract people to me who have that same drive and that same urgency of wanting to make a difference. Great. Uh, here is a question from Caitlin. Um, she says, although more women are running for Congress, there is still a long way to go to achieve gender parity. How can we increase race and gender parities in Congress? Yeah, we've been doing a lot of work on this behind the scenes really since um, before I ran for office. You know, I've worked with uh, um, the Women's uh, Donor Network around their big project to really encourage and support women running for office because the barriers are enormous. And if you're a woman of color, even bigger, um, everything from raising money to uh, a lot of the lower level jobs are not full-time jobs if you're mm -hmm. serving on a school board or something else. So how do we get um, donors to establish funds that can support women who are in who want to run for office but can't possibly do it for $30,000 or for nothing? Right. Um, and so a lot of those pieces, I think, are infrastructure pieces that we need to build. But then also we just need to change our definitions of what successful uh, candidates look like. I know when I was going to run and I talk about this in the book, 
some very well-meaning women's organizations and women leaders came to me and said, you know what, um, we have another woman who's very good at fundraising and is very well known. And she happened to be a Caucasian woman. And they said, you know, why don't you run for something else? Wait, your, you know, wait a few mm. years and run for something else. Um, and, and, you know, she'll be better at raising money. I mean, the amount of money you have to raise is just crazy. You know, we don't, we don't think you're quite ready for that. And I just smiled and I said, with all due respect, I welcome her to the race, but I am an animal when it comes to campaigning. So she better be ready. <laughs> um, and then she ended up not, not running and I won. Um, so, you know, I just think that we have to be clear that what we think is going to be successful is not always real and then push back against it if we're the ones that are being told we can't run or we can't do something. Right. Um, great. Let's see. Um, here is a question um, from Francesca. Um, what advice do you have for young minority women who want to succeed in politics and how do you overcome aversion? Um, and then she says, thank you for all that you do. You're an inspiration. Oh, thank you so much, Monica. Um, I don't know what you mean by aversion, but um, my advice would be, you know, I think that getting some experience is really important. So mm -hmm. working, volunteering for a campaign, we have interns in our office that are phenomenal, um, both on the campaign side, but also on the official side. Um, and a lot of them are young women of color who want to be in an office with a woman of color. Um, and I try to make time, even if it's brief, to talk to people about their experiences and, and my experiences and help people to navigate those challenging moments. And that's part of the reason I wrote the book. Um, so experience is really good. I would also say working in your community is really important. Um, when I ran, people knew who I was because I had been doing the work for 12 years already. Mm -hmm. And so nobody wondered what I was going to be like or what I stood for. And it made for such an easy race. And I think that not easy, but such such a better um, race for me. And I think that sometimes people want to go immediately into elected office. And that's OK. There are some people that do that and they do very well. But I personally like the idea of working in the community and showing what you can do and building relationships um, and understanding what the issues are on the ground before you run for office. I think it makes you a more, generally makes you a more successful elected. Um, so you mentioned uh, speaking to interns. I think this, um, this question is from Harsha. And it sounds like she was uh, an intern on the Hill. She said that you're a great role model, especially for Asian American females looking to enter politics. Um, and then she says, um, hold on, I just lost her. A minute. Let me find it back. Oh, here we go. Um, it definitely, uh, she says, I enjoyed greeting you and speaking with you when I was interning at the Democratic Caucus. It definitely felt like I was meeting a celebrity. Uh, I was just wondering, what is your advice for setting yourself apart from others and proving your qualifications when applying for political positions or running for office? Um, I really think it's about um, doing the research. So mm -hmm. really doing whatever research you have and then laying the groundwork with whatever networks you have. So the networks are important, um, reaching out to people that you know and um, convincing people and, and really thinking through, I was just helping my 23 year old with some interviews the other day. And I said, you know, before you start your interview and I would say before you even send your letter in, think yeah. about what is it that makes you so uniquely qualified to be successful in this job? Because whatever the questions are that are asked of you, you have to answer them in some way. Try to find a way to bring in those things. And that will set you apart because most people don't prep really for interviews and they go in. And I'm always um, surprised, honestly, when I interview people that they, they haven't really done the research into the office. They don't necessarily know what my positions are. Um, they don't have a real compelling reason why they want to work for me. And so if that's the case and I've got 10 candidates and one has done the research and knows what I've stood for and knows my positions and read my essays and can tell me why they personally care about those issues and want to work there, they're going to be the all out winner. So I think that's, you know, hard work and your own thought thinking to um, establish why you think you're particularly good for that job. Right. It's not unlike applying to colleges that right. theoretically folks have done because it's, again, learning about the school and then what makes you someone that they would want to have. Right. So That's the right. same same sort of 
concept, I think, applies exactly. to that. Yeah. Exactly. Um, let's see. And, and one other yeah. thing, you know, just for women that yeah. I think I have I have trouble with, I've gotten better with, is we're not very good at bragging about right. ourselves all the time. Right. And I remember when I was running, and I think this is in the book, my consultant said to me, Pramila, you have to say um, what you did. You're, you have to say your accomplishments clearly at least three times because people don't listen to you. Hmm. If they listen to you, they don't hear you. And if they hear you, they don't believe you. That's, that's the typical way that people see women candidates and particularly women of color candidates. So, you know, we just have to get a little bit better about bragging, even if people call us too ambitious or, you know, or, right. or overconfident or whatever else they, they say about us that they never say about men. Um, we just have to get used to doing that. Um, here's a question from uh, Sudha. She says, how do we motivate people to vote, especially who are Bernie Sanders fans? Well, you know, um, what's interesting is I think that there are, a, a I've been going out and talking to um, all of the, the Bernie Sanders folks because I was his national health policy chair. And I've just been making the very clear argument that everything that we care about, that young people care about, free college, Green New Deal, Medicare for all, immigration reform, um, you know, whatever it is, all of the things that we, that are out there, uh, no progress is possible without with Trump and the White House. Mm -hmm. And I just take them through that and talk them through that. And I recognize the frustration with the system because Trump is both a symptom and a cause. And I talk about this in the book as well. Um, there, there are many decisions that incrementalism has allowed to happen that put us in the position that allowed Trump to be successful in running for president. And so we have to recognize that incrementalism has hurt this country tremendously, and Democrats have sometimes been at the front of that. However, there is a very big difference between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. And I, I just talk to people about that. And I think that it will help if he picks a progressive vice president. Um, let's see where that decision goes. But that will obviously help to motivate people across the country as well. But we've all got to do our part and really make the argument for why this is the most important election of our lifetime, or we are running down a path to fascism very quickly and dictatorship if Trump gets another four years. Do you have any favorites on the uh, the uh, long shortlist? There are so many great candidates, and I know so many of them. In fact, I've talked to um, over four of them in the last twenty four hours. So uh, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't want to weigh in on a particular one. But I'll just say that I think that there are some phenomenal women who are um, in the running, and I'm looking forward to seeing what what Joe Biden. Um, what he what he ends up with. I just hope it is somebody who can energize young people and folks of color, because when you think about Michigan, you think about a presidential election, very different than a congressional race in a swing district where you really do need independence. Um, you know, a state like Michigan, we lost in 2016 by 10,000 votes. And there were 100,000 people that um, that didn't turn out to vote that had voted in the previous election for Obama. And that doesn't even include the undercount of people who went to the ballot and, and filled out every line except for the president of the United States. So we win when our base turns out and we desperately need our base of young people and folks of color um, to, to turn out for this election so that we can beat Donald Trump. Here's a question from Nina who says she can relate to you. She says, I left a prominent Wall Street law firm to join the UN as the first woman legal advisor to the UN peacekeeping mission in Lebanon during the war. It was my experience in college of traveling solo to the West Bank and Gaza and visiting refugee camps that profoundly affected my career mm -hmm. change and my entire life. Can you elaborate on the power of exposing oneself to conflict affected countries to see the di dire predicament of others? Wow. Well, first of all, congratulations on those tremendous accomplishments. Um, that is really remarkable. Um, I do think, you know, and I, I have Carolyn Forche's book in, in my shelves here. Um, I do think that being exposed to those conflict ridden areas does numerous things. And, and I felt this and I write about this with the refugee camps in Thailand, but also my propensity to go right to the middle of any conflict, whether it's on the southern border, meeting with you know families in jails who have been separated from their children. I think that when you are in those situations, it expands your vision 
of the gravity of the work that we do. You see the responsibility that you bear to make the world a better place when you're in those situations. It is impossible to turn your head when you're in a conflict-ridden situation personally, not when you're watching it on TV, but when you're there personally. And the experiences that you have, and I know you saw this in Lebanon, and by the way, uh, what horror with the explosion in, in mm. Lebanon right now that's, that's happening and the deaths that we're seeing. But you know, I know you saw it and I saw it, that the one-on-one -on -one contact with the mother in a refugee camp, um, the 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 woman in in the West Bank, the the child in you know in that's been separated from their parent, that one-on-one -on -one contact and the way it pierces to your heart, there is no replacement for that when you're trying to advocate for change and you tell that story, you feel it deeply and it changes dramatically who you are how you see the world and what you end up doing with your life. Um, let's see, I think we have time for uh, one more question here. Um, this one is from Callie and she says, what advice would you give to women new to public positions and the spotlight? That's a great question. I think what I would say is do your homework. Don't rest on your laurels. Um, don't think that because you got a position, now you deserve it. You work for it every day um, and um, you know, just continue to trust your intuition. I think this is the biggest thing when you're when you're new in a position, um, and particularly a position of leadership. I find so many women, myself included, uh, I've had to work hard on this, tend to undercut ourselves at the very beginning. We say things like, "Well, you know, I don't really, I, I haven't really done this before. I don't really know this issue." Actually, we probably know more than the ten guys sitting around us. <laughs> so we just have to stop undercutting ourselves and um, and have confidence in our intuitions. And if we believe that something is the right way to go, examine that intuition. Don't brush it away because everyone else is telling you it's not the right way to go. If you, I remember when I was leading meetings, um, I would sometimes start them with a little moment of meditation. It was such a hard thing to do because in this environment, you know, people feel like you gotta go right to what, right. You're, what you're trying to do. But I really felt it was important to build that level of connection. And so for, for some period of time in my life, I used to start meetings that way because it felt like the right thing to do. And people around me really appreciated it when it's authentic. If it's put on, they will know. So don't put it on. But if it's authentic and if you feel it, um, find alternate ways to lead than the ones that are being given to you. Find your own way to lead. Mm -hmm. Find your own power of leadership. Here's another another quick one um, from Gloria. She wants to know advice you'd give young politicians who want to run for office. The same ones that I gave earlier, you yeah. know, work in your community. Think about who you want to be, not what uh, think about what you want to do, not who you want to be. This is right. not about a name and a platform. Um, do the work, build the community relationships and be humble, um, but be confident. Is that a <laughs> <laughs> both of those things are important? You know, always assess yourself but but know that you have the power to do what you want to do. That's great. And before we um, say goodbye, I do want to draw everybody's attention to, um, this is going to be the, our last summer series of Women on Wednesdays. Um, we've done 12 of them this summer. And thank you, everybody who's participated. But they've been so terrific. We're going to do a fall series of Women on Wednesdays as well. And we're going to kick it off uh, on the actual uh, suffrage uh, anniversary date of the 19th Amendment going into effect on August 26th uh, and talk about just that, uh, Suffrage at 100. It's a new book um, by two professors um, who they're going to, it's a compilation of different essays. And so they're going to be here um, to talk about that on um, August 26th. And then the next uh, week after that, September 2nd, we're going to have um, Dr. Martha Jones, uh, she is a professor at Johns Hopkins, and she has um, written a new book called Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All. So that'll be uh, September 2nd. And then um, the last in our suffrage series is going to be September 9th um, with uh, a new podcast that's coming out. I think it's out now. There's a couple episodes out if anyone's interested. It's called She Votes. Um, and Lynn Scher, um, who's a former correspondent with ABC News, and Ellen Goodman, who was formerly with the Boston Globe, are the hosts of the podcast. And they're going to be here uh, to talk about that as well. So 
we will look forward uh, to seeing everybody then. Uh, but we're going to have two weeks off. I have to take my daughter to college in Texas. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> so we're be down there. Um, but thank you, everybody, for um, tuning in. Thank you, Congresswoman, for being with us. Um, congratulations on the book. Uh, and we will uh, continue to watch you. Thank you so much, <laughs> Betsy. So great to be with you and everybody on the call. Great. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.